Hello teenagers and welcome back to uh, Church Online. Uh, this is lesson six of term four. And so all of you are um, heavily into exams and finishing off the year. Um, we have actually decided that we will meet this week. So if you're watching this lesson, then it's likely that you haven't come to church or maybe you just loved the lesson so much that you wanted to watch a bit more. But, um, but yeah, so I'm going to be doing this twice today as I'm recording and then when I share with you on Sunday but also we will be meeting at the church in the youth room and I, I really encourage you guys to try and come back to church uh, we can social distance we can do all the COVID-19 stuff that we need to and um, our, our area is safe we also have an outside area if we need more space and so yeah so that is what we're going to be doing for the rest of the term I will continue to um, share these videos and these teachings on the last few teachings of the year and we are also going to do an advent series uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun with Christmas this year because it's been a bit of a dreary year it's been a tough year and so I thought that we could at least just make Christmas fun so um, I'm trying to hide the background because um, we are moving house and so the, the place is chaos. Um, I actually thought I would try to find somewhere else to record from, but every spot is worse than the last. And uh, so there's boxes, those enormous black things, which side, that side, oh, this is confusing, are just piles of boxes filled with stuff that needs to be moved. And so that's my story, if you wanted to know where I am at. But yeah, so I, I did at least need enough the couches, but I'm sorry, I can't hide the boxes. There's nowhere to put them. And then... um. Guys, what else? What other news? Uh, yes, at the end of November, the last time we are together in November, I'm going to be giving you a, a little gift, which I've put together for you, which is an Advent devotional. So it will be, um, it's going to be like a collection of, of little cards and, and an Advent um, calendar for the month of um, December up until Christmas Day. And I do hope you guys will take the time to to spend considering the Christmas story. I know that we do the Christmas story every year because we have to because it's Christmas every year. And um, and maybe you all know it well, but there's just there's just, it's just such a time of joy and such a time of um, you know we get a sense that peace is coming and that peace is possible. Um, and especially at this time where there hasn't been a lot of peace worldwide, there's horrible things going on. Um, including terrorism, there's you know racism, there's it's there's this terrible scourge of gender-based violence in this country. There's uh, there's racism. We don't know what we're doing here half the time. I don't know. I sometimes I'm scared to open my mouth in case I, I get into trouble with some I don't know some group of people. It's very tough at the moment. So we're gonna try and make Christmas fun, and uh, so that's what I've put together for you guys. And um, and I hope that you will spend some time uh, fun and and also we just really want to consider the fact that Jesus came. He came to earth and in the midst of because there's nothing new under the sun, according to the Bible, and I believe it. Um, you know, in the time that Jesus arrived, they were desperate for peace. They were desperate for non-hatred, non-violence, uh, for joy. And um, and so and we are too. And we always need that. So, so I want us just to think about Christmas a little deeper than the tinsel and the baubles and the, the, the shelves packed with toys and goods and, you know, and what are we getting for Christmas kind of thing. So, so that is what we're going to be preparing for. And then the last thing I want to tell you is that I'm using a new recording program. I'm not going to tell you about it because I'm totally tech non-competent, but um, I have to click on things and it'll apparently bring up the stuff that you need to see on the screen so I'll have to look down because I can't like do this in click so yeah it is what it is so please excuse me while we get that right but today's teaching I am the way the truth and the life now you know this statement has often been used to hurt people um we 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 take it as a statement that Jesus is saying I am the only way 
to God. And while we acknowledge that as Christians, um, we don't we don't deny that. Um, it's not the core understanding of this teaching. Um, and to understand this this teaching, we always always have to look at context, but we really have to take this this whole situation into account when we look at this teaching. So, so instead of coming out with a with a, um, a an understanding that we must now go and say to people, well, you're not getting to heaven because you haven't been through Jesus, and and ra- and starting to exclude people and um, and bash them for their beliefs. Um, we get, we just want to think about this in a little bit of a different light. We just want to be able to, to say to people, this was Jesus's message to his disciples who were in a certain space, in a certain uh, space, physically and emotionally and mentally. And they needed this message. They needed to hear this from Jesus. And while we don't deny that Jesus is the way, the way, the way to God and the way to eternal life, um, let's look at the context so we fully understand what is being said now. It's said here. So what's going on? What is the situation into which Jesus speaks these words? Um, so firstly, the the chapter before is uh, number John chapter thirteen. We're going to read from fourteen. But in John chapter thirteen, it's the story of the Last Supper. Um, that Jesus is gathered with his disciples for the Passover meal. Um, we know it as the Last Supper. At the time, the disciples did not know that this was the last time they would be sharing a meal together with their beloved teacher, um, with their little group. And it was a tough gathering. It wasn't a party. Now, maybe we've forgotten what, what joyful meals with lots of friends and family have felt like because we've been in lockdown and we haven't really socialized as much. But... Um, I love sharing a meal with with friends and family. It's one of my favorite things to do because I love to eat and I love to be with people that I love. And so I, if I think of a gathering around a meal, it's a happy, joyous experience for me. I don't think that it had been quite the same for the disciples and for Jesus thus far. So first of all, um, they'd gathered, they'd arranged for a place to meet and then they'd started the dinner and Jesus had washed his disciples' feet. You will recall that he said to them, Come, I'm gonna come all together, I am gonna wash your feet. I, the master, am gonna wash the servants' feet. And they were totally freaked out. They were like, Really, Jesus? No, you don't have to do this. And he insists, and then he's then he tells them, You now have to go out and do the same for other people. So he's told them that they have to go into the world and serve people who are subordinate to them. Um, it's a big teaching. You know, having a servant's heart is is wonderful. But now to be told that as a leader, you're going to go out and still wash people's feet. And it, was a, it was a big teaching. So they started with that. And then um, at a point, Jesus, uh, he's already mentioned a few times that someone's going to betray him. And they're all like, oh, not me, not me, not me. And, and then at a point in the, the dinner, uh, Jesus identifies the person, Judas, who will betray him. And not only betray him, but then have him killed. So there's like the shock and horror. And um, and then Jesus has told Peter, who is shocked that someone's going to betray Jesus. And Peter absolutely adores Jesus. And then Jesus tells him, but Peter, you're also going to deny me. And you're going to deny me three times. So it wasn't a comfortable gathering. I think that tensions were running very high. You know, those situations where you can feel the tension in the room. They say you can cut it with a knife. Um, and I think it was a little bit like that. If I had been sitting in that room experiencing it, I think I would have been having a panic attack by the time it had got to this next point where we read together. So then in this next chapter, Jesus actually begins to comfort his disciples because they have, they're actually quite distressed. Um, chapter 14, where we're going to read from, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, is, is known as a farewell discourse. So, in chapter 14 to 17, Jesus spends some time um, preparing the disciples for his departure. He's been with them for three years, and now he's saying to them, okay, I'm going. He's told them all, I'm going to be betrayed and killed, and that, and I have to do this. And they're all still a little bit confused, but in this farewell discourse, Jesus gives them some 
uh, some ideas, rules, you know, how, how to do this, how to manage this. He promises them that the Holy Spirit will come and comfort them and console them and also guide them in the future. And he also spends a lot of time praying for them, a lot of intercessory prayer. And he says goodbye to them. So let's read together from John 14. And I'm going to read from verse 1. And uh, the actual verse where you, we find I am the way, the truth, and the life is 14 verse 6. But I'm going to read a little bit further so you can just get the whole story. And I'm going to put the scripture up on the screen because of this awesome new program. But there we go. It worked. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. So that is the reading uh, from John 14. And let's just explain a little bit. The disciples are confused. They're often confused. You know, we have this wonderful um, position of being able to look back of being able to read and research and and understand and know what was being going on. It's called retrospect. In retrospect, uh, things are much clearer. But the disciples were in the situation, and a lot of the time they were confused. Jesus was a little bit cryptic. He sometimes spoke in riddles and parables, and um, they didn't always understand. So they were confused, and then they asked him, Jesus, we don't know where you're going. How are we supposed to know then how to follow you there? And uh, Jesus' I am statement is answering this question. How do we know? How do we know how to get there? Where are you going? Um, you've told us you're going now. We're all totally freaked out because of this very, tra very traumatic experience at the Last Supper. And now you tell us you're going and, and we don't know how to get there. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, um, he's telling them how to get there. He's answering that question. And Jesus says to his disciples, and remember, his disciples are Jewish, so they have a full understanding of his use of the words I am, the name I am, the great and the most holy God. Um, he says, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. And we're going to have a look at all three of those. So when Jesus says he is the way, um, I think we've all we've all realized that Jesus sometimes did things on a whim. You know, it seemed as if it was on a, the, a last moment decision, you know, last minute dot com type of thing. Um, he'd say, OK, now we're going to go that way. And then he'd say, OK, we need to get away from these people because we're overwhelmed and we've worked so hard and we need to have some time for ourselves and to go and pray. So let's get in our boats and then we'll just go to the other side of the lake there. So Jesus did things like like that. And so. um, So. A good example was when uh, Jesus was told about Lazarus being unwell and and then he decided not to go and everyone was shocked because they were thinking, well, Jesus loves this man and it's one of his friends. Why doesn't he go and, and save him? And then two days later, he said, suddenly says to his disciples, okay, now we're going to go. And then they're like, okay, but we were in Judea recently and they try to stone you. Are you sure you want to go back there? And Jesus is like, yeah, we're going back there. And so then Thomas even says this, let us also go so that we may die with him. Um, they didn't always know where he was going. He went crazy places, but they followed. They followed and they went with him faithfully. Um, I think it must have been quite a ride hanging out with Jesus. So just understand the confusion. I'm going to a place that has many rooms, he says. You guys know the way. Um, there's also a room for you guys, but you can't come with me. Not yet. Um, but don't worry, because I'm going to get your spots ready, and then one day you can join me there. Total confusion. 
Thomas asks, where are you going? We don't know where you are going. So how are we supposed to know the way to get there? He's thinking physical. He's thinking a physical place. We're going to uh, go off to another town or we're going to cross another lake. Um, but Jesus is talking spiritual. And then in verse 12, a little further on, Jesus actually says to them, I am going to the Father. So when Jesus says he is the way and I am the way for you to get there and I am going to the Father, he is saying, I am the way to God. So let's just explain a little bit. And I think we did touch on this in last week's lesson, but it's always good to rehash. So God and humankind are all good. In the Garden of Eden, uh, their relationship is perfect. Um, they meet with each other once a day in the garden. It says that uh, God appears to Adam and Eve. And, you know, whether or not you believe in the, 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 the actual physical reality of that story, the point is their relationship was perfect and open and honest and there were no barriers um, and they were close with their creator and with their God. And then enter sin in the form of the serpent. And then God and humankind were torn apart. God had to punish them. He had to chase them from the garden because they disobeyed him. They would used their uh, gift of free choice to reject God. And so he sent them out of the garden with certain consequences. But now there was this barrier, this huge, huge gap. this actually like a chasm between God and humankind. And... The rest of the Bible story, of self, the story of salvation, was God's attempt and his way to get us back together with him, okay? To get us back to, back to that perfect relationship with him. And, of course, God implemented that with the, the birth of the nation of Israel. Um, Israel would be the tool to heal the relationship between humankind and God. And God even came up with this elaborate um well between god and israel you know they came up with this elaborate uh, system a uh, sacrificial system which we have learned about before about um about how they they had to shed the blood of an animal to atone for their sins and it, it, it became it was an annual celebration once a year the um the the jewish folk would take their lamb their perfectly unblemished lamb uh, to the temple and the high priest would perform a sacrifice, and the the shedding of the blood would then atone for the sin. Atonement, listen to this, you break it up, it goes like this, at one mint. So being in a state of at one. So they then that made them at one with God. But but despite that, um they didn't really get it right. Israel continued to disobey God. They continued to choose against God. They continued to betray God. And even this beautiful system of, of trying to reconcile the relationship didn't work. So the next part of the, the plan, because now the gap is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, this huge gap between God and humanity just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and remember, people people you guys remember you guys god loved these people so much that he he desperately tried to fix this um and then the next part of the plan came in in the in the form of the human jesus who came to earth and was born to be the sacrifice so we need to have a close relationship with god there is a reason that things were perfect in the garden of eden it was because of that perfect relationship that Adam and Eve, that humankind had with their creator. You know, God made us to be in relationship with him. He made us to be in a close, close relationship with him. And when we are not in that close relationship with him, and some of you may have experienced this before, some of you may be going through it now, um, but when we are not in that close relationship with God, things aren't like hundreds with us, you know. We, um, we, we, we don't feel 100%. We are not whole. We are not complete without God. And we try and make ourselves whole and we try and make our lives full um, with all manner of activities and things, with money, celebrity status, influence, sex, drugs, power in our friend groups, fancy clothes, shoes, new tech, Instagram likes and shout outs, 
we look for all these ways to try and fill this emptiness, this, this gap, this thing that's going on in our separation from God. And um, none of that, none of that can bridge the gap, can close the chasm. None of that can, because only God can make us complete. Only God can make us whole. Not even the person you love. You have, If you have a partner, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, and you think that that person makes you whole, that person doesn't make you whole. You are only made whole with God. And in fact, two broken people trying to make each other whole is, a, is just a recipe for disaster, but that's a lesson for another day. God makes you whole. And there's a quote by a French physicist, which I really love. It's one of my favorite quotes in the world. He says, his name's Blaise Pascal, and he says, um, he says this, and I actually think that I don't have it here. Sorry. So I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person, which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the creator made known through Jesus Christ. Do you not think that people through the millennia have tried to fill this God-shaped vacuum in their hearts? They have tried and they have tried and they have found that they cannot fill it with anything created by humankind. They can only fill this God-shaped vacuum with God, made known to us through Jesus Christ. So, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. He directs us back to God. He is the GPS, so to speak, the uh, the Ways app that guides us to and takes us to God. Um, Jesus died. His blood had to be shed so that the path back to God could be secured. Um, and it's like it's kind of like a two-way road. So. Uh, we were far from our creator. He's in heaven. We're on earth. We've made this, this huge gap. Heaven came down to earth in the form of baby Jesus. And then this little bit of heaven that was on earth offers his life to open that road back for us, to get back to heaven so that the gap between God and us could be closed and that uh, we could one day return to him and be with him forever. So that is a little explanation, probably a bit of a long one, on the the way. Now, to speak about the truth, and I mean, this, is, this might be a little bit difficult to understand. I even struggle to put it into words, but I think if you can even just get a little bit of what I'm trying to say, it's quite profound. Um, now, a truth, if Jesus is the way and the truth, remember Jesus is saying, I'm the truth. Um, a truth is different from a fact in that, there is a moral and emotional aspect, okay? If I see a red chair and I declare that chair is red, well, that is the truth, but it's also, it's, it's just a fact. So there's truth in that fact, but if someone argues with me and says, well, no, it's actually maroon, and then I say, well, you know, in terms of the color wheel and shades and tints, well, it's actually red, and then I feel I feel good because I've actually conveyed all this information, and my belief has now been um, expressed. Then that starts to become truth. Do you see? There's an emotional connection here. So, okay, and that's probably a really bad example, but um, the point is that when I say the chair is red, it's it's probably pretty blatant and pretty obvious. But there will still be people who will try to say, mm -mm -mm, maybe not, or it's a different kind of red. But but there is a an emotional attachment to truth, which there isn't to fact. And um, truth, I, I try to look for a, a definition, but, you know, secular definitions don't really do justice to Jesus declaring that he is the truth. So, so I came up with this. Truth is the exact relation between two things. Um, a word is true when it corresponds perfectly with the fact or the idea that it expresses. Does that make sense? Um, if I say the chair is red, my idea corresponds perfectly because the chair is red, even though you guys can't see the chair. 
Um, so this is the truth, okay? My idea corresponds with the actual facts. So a maths sum is true when it accurately gives the results um, of a relationship between two different things, two different quantities, or, or you know, you guys do something like um, a minus x squared plus 42 equals p over q times 4. Um, that equals sign, I don't do maths, so I made that up, and I definitely don't do maths when there's letters involved. I can probably only deal with numbers. But, okay, do you understand that if I said this side of the equation equals this side of the equation, um, there's a perfectly harmonious relationship between those two things because I've said that they are equal to each other. So the truth, the truth is this perfect relationship between the two ideas. The two things, okay, now, um, here, when Jesus says, I am the truth, um, this is a relationship, a perfectly harmonious relationship between humankind and God, and it is made possible by Jesus, who provides the harmony. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the equal sign. He puts the equal sign um, in the sum. He, he closes the gap that Satan opened, and in that he is the truth. And Satan is the total opposite of truth. He opposes and he contradicts everything that is good and that is peaceful. Um, I'm going to put up a few verses now for you to look at, and I'm going to read through, through them. John 8 verse uh, 44 says that, uh, and I, I think I might have got these wrong. Uh, do I, I didn't put John 8 verse 44 in. Uh, Satan, oh no, no, this is the wrong slide. I'm sorry. I'm hiding it again. Oh, I'm back. Okay, these are the verses that I came up with. John 8 verse 44 says, Satan was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and he is the father of all lies. Can you see any truth in that? When Jesus says, I am the truth, there's no truth in the, in, in the someone who is the father of all lies. In John 10 verse 10, and we actually read this last week and with the, the gate for the sheep. The thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. Guys, Satan brings discord. He brings pain. He brings hurt. He brings brokenness, he brings distrust, he brings fear, he brings terror. Um, and Jesus and Satan, they are total opposites. They're like true versus false, uh, light versus dark, the dark, deep, evil stuff, good versus bad, love versus hate, faith versus fear. Satan makes the chasm wider. The, the, the gap that was formed when Satan and sin entered the world, when sin entered the world, all Satan does is he just pulls us further and further away from God. He makes that chasm wider and wider. And he cannot, he, there's nothing that he can do to make it closer. Someone who is the father of all lies, how can, he, there's nothing Satan can do to, to bring us closer to God. Only Jesus can bring that perfect harmony, that perfect uh, peace to our relationship with God that, that makes it truth. Jesus is the truth. I hope that makes some sense to you. Um, if you want to engage, please chat to me during the week about that. And then Jesus says, thirdly, I am the light. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Jesus is the way to eternal life. Um, Jesus became the atoning sacrifice. His bloodshed allowed us to be with God in eternity, in heaven for eternity, forever. Forever is a big word. Um, in 2 Corinthians 5, and I think these are the verses that I have for you. Yes. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Um, you can get the sense of how Jesus bridged a gap, how Jesus uh, closed the chasm in that verse. And then in John 3, verse 36, um, it says, Whoever believes in the Son 
has eternal life. And then in that verse we know so well, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And I want to put it all together now, just to try and wrap up a little bit. Okay, so Jesus says, I am the way. And that is in a sense, he's giving us directions. I am the GPS. I am the the map. Um, I only learned to use Garmin and GPS and everything about two years ago. Previously, I actually legitimately had a map book in my car. Do you guys, do you guys even... I don't know, have you even looked at maps lately to get to places? I don't know. But when Jesus says, I am the way, he's saying, I am the directions. Think of it as a garment. And then he says, I am the truth. I am the mediator. I am the peacemaker between, between you and God. I am the gap closer. And then he says, I am the life. You know, other ways will seem okay. And, and, and they are okay. I mean, people, there are good people in the world who aren't Christian. But Jesus gives us life. Jesus gives us the eternal life that he closes the gap so that we can re-enter heaven and be with God again one day. You know, guys, God was is so perfect. He cannot be near evil. There is no ways that this perfect, pure God could could come up close with the sin that we had in us because we accepted it into our lives. So Jesus came to advocate for us, to mediate between us and God, to be the high priest. Remember I said to you earlier how the high priest was the one who offered the sacrifices um, for, the, for the atonement. He would be the one who, who offered the, the, shed the blood so that the, so that the Jewish people could atone for their sins. Now, only the high priest could enter a place called the Holy of Holies. In the temple, there was a, a, a point where, where the Ark of the Covenant was stored or was placed. And that was called the Holy of Holies. And it was understood by the Jewish people that God dwelled in that Ark. He lived in that place. So he was amongst them. Um, and the Ark of the Covenant went all over the place with them through the wilderness and everyone eventually had found its home in the temple and it was placed in the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could go in there. The people uh, understood that if they went in there and came close to God, then they would be struck down by this perfect righteousness. Um, normal people could not be in the presence of the great I Am, in the presence of Yahweh, in the presence of this most high God. So so only the high priest could go there. And incidentally, he his robes, attached to his robes, were when he went into the Holy of Holies, there was a string with a bell on um, in case he, he was struck down by the holiness of God. And then um, people, the other priests would, you know, know to ring the bell to check if he was alive or not. Um, so that's how seriously they took this, this gap between them and God. And Jesus becomes our high priest. Jesus is the one who, who offered the sacrifice. He was the sacrifice that allowed us to close this gap. And now we no longer stand apart from God. We're not separated at the entrance to the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant, where God dwelt, at the entrance was this curtain. And actually, when Jesus dies, when he's crucified, in the moment of his death, it says that that curtain was torn in two. Why? Because we don't need that separation between us and God anymore. It's gone, gone, gone. Jesus is our high priest. He's paid the price. He stood before the Lord. He's, uh, he's, he's shed the blood. He is the sacrifice. And he is the truth that gives us eternal life. And then, I mean, isn't that powerful? I just, I think that's so beautiful. Um, uh, yeah, it kind of blows me away every time I think about it. But just another reminder that when you use a GPS, is GPS the right word even? Is that what like Google Maps is? Yes. When you use that thing and you go the wrong way, which I sometimes do because I think I know better, you know. 
um, than some random person who's actually connected to a satellite. So I don't know where I think I get the knowledge from. But sometimes I will decide I know a better route. And then I will take that route. And the, the, the guy on the phone will be saying to me, um, turn here, turn here, because he'll be trying to take me back to the route that I was on. Then when I still just persist in going against that route, he will start to say rerouting, rerouting. Have you heard that? Do you know what I'm talking about? And it's exactly the same with God. We don't always choose the way. We lose sight of Jesus. Our lives take over. The world takes over. Things happen and we go off course. But Jesus is always okay rerouting us. He's always okay when we come back to him and we say, I've gone the wrong way, but I want to get back on your path, on this path with you. I want to follow you the way, Jesus. And he just keeps saying to us, I'm rerouting, I'm rerouting. It's just a matter of time until we hopefully eventually hear him saying, do a U-turn, which is illegal. How do they tell you to do a U-turn? I don't understand. Um, but reroute, reroute, turn here, turn here, come back my way. Jesus, there's, there's, there's no end to the chances that we have. There's no end to his grace and there's no end to his mercy. And um, so we may not always get it right. Um, we may not always get to Jesus the first time, get this way right. Um, but it doesn't matter because he is still the way and he is still the truth. He will always be the truth. And in him, we have eternal life. Let's pray together. Lord, Heavenly Father, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the way to God, and we need God. And we need, we need, we need him to make us whole. We need our creator to continuously be reminding us how we were created and what we were created for. And so when there is this huge big gap between us, um, we just know that things aren't right. And so we need you. We need the way. We need to know the way. And you are the way. And Lord, you are the truth. You are the pure and perfect truth. And there is nothing, nothing devious. There is nothing evil. There is nothing bad. There is nothing um, dark. There is nothing of Satan's nature in you. And so we trust, we trust that your way, that your that your uh, that your guidance, your um, your directions. When we follow your way, when we when we follow your route on the GPS, we just trust fully that you are going to take us to God. That you are going to direct us along the path that will lead us to Him, and that will lead us to eternity with Him, and that will lead us to a place of peace and wholeness and joy and love and righteousness, and goodness, and a place where we can live abundantly, where we can uh, live and love and experience peace in relationships, harmony in relationships, joy in relationships, and Lord, where we can just know your truth for our lives. And so Lord, I just pray that no matter how many times we disobey your commands uh, to stay on this on this path, your your, we disobey the voice that is saying to us, come with me, follow me, keep following me on this way. No matter how many times we go off the path, you will reroute us. You will be there standing, waiting for us to do our U-turn and to get back on the path that is the way to God. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And I just pray, Lord, that you would keep reminding us that you are the way and that you would reveal yourself to those who have forgotten that you are the way, or who are lost, who are, who are bashing through places of darkness, thorny bushes, and, um, and, and, and places in their lives where they're just feeling pain and, and trauma, and that you would just remind them that at the end of that darkness, there's a light, and that if they could just grab a hold of that light, they will get back on the path that will take them through the truth to God, our Father, the Lord Most High. And we pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Guys, I really do hope to see you in person in the youth room uh, one of these Sundays. But um, but for those of you who are still catching me online, drop me a line, a hello, a hi, how are you? Because I miss you and it will be really nice to hear from you. And we continue to pray for you through this exam time. Our matriculants are going strong, um, but you guys all have a lot on your plates. So I just pray that you will all stick to your timetables and your plans and just remind yourselves that you've got this um, and that you are empowered and that you are in charge of, uh, of the marks and the results that you can get. And so I'll see you next week. So deep.